Okay, you made it to the very end. It's good. Last lecture, take a little break, a little uh, breathing break. If you have to go to the restroom, that's fine. And uh, we'll go. We'll start the last lecture. Raise your hand if you uh, have a training program. Does any of your institutions have a training program? Sounds good. Raise your hand uh, if you know what the continued learning environment is. Okay, good. So a lot of you don't know, and that's what I'm here to tell you. So just like how the JCO comes and makes a visit, the same thing is going to happen with the ACGME. So I'll just explain the situation that occurs, and when they do come, and at least you'll know how it's happening. All right, let's uh, move on. So there's a, well, it, it, they talked about this, Dr. Geiser said this yesterday, new executive order, Trump signs uh, order, stop blaming anesthesia. So it seems like we always get the, the blame, so it's just one more thing. I'm glad he's signing it. So objectives, we're de going to describe the rationale and goals for the continuing learning environment, and we're going to identify some resources and provide examples, at least how our institution and how possibly your institution can use uh, to modify the continuing learning environment at your institution. So what's the ACGM role? Well, the actions at ACGME must fulfill the social contract. So as we're going to train residents and we have trainees, we have to maintain an educational environment that's uniform. We must assure that there's safety and quality of resident care. We must provide humanistic educational environment with core principles, uh, such as professionalism in our trainees. And we have to make sure that education is not marginalized or seen as less relevant to the institutional mission. So there's lifelong learning, and, and it's not just something that it has many dimensions, and it's more than just like having a, a classroom or just being in a classroom. So lifelong learning should be ongoing, it should be voluntary, and it should be self-motivated. And in fact, the concept of lifelong, lifelong learning was first introduced in 1971 in Denmark. So we all know about the ACGME core competencies, and that's what we've been evaluated when we were going through residency, and that's what they continue to do that. So patient care is one of them. So there are six of them. So patient care should be uh, self, it should be centered, it should be developmental, it should be age appropriate and effective on how we treat patients. Also, you have to have the medical knowledge, which you have to understand, you have to be able to demonstrate, acquire, critically interpret and apply this medical knowledge at, as you practice anesthesia. Also, practice-based learning and improvement is really important, important. so that's a continuous self-assessment, and you want to be able to uh, improve one's patient care as you progress and graduate. There's also communication skills. You have to be able to communicate and have interpersonal communication and partner with patients. Professionalism, it employs a lot of uh, the, one, the, the other five core competencies, but you have to be responsible, you have to have accountability, you have to be sensitive to the needs of patients. And the last one is system-based practice, where you have to be able to advocate for patients and be able to change how you practice so uh, you give better patient care. So the continuous learning environment, and that R stands for review, and what they'll do is it was established in 2012, and that was a component of the ACGME's next, uh, next accreditation system. So that's just now starting, and, and generally what they do is they're gonna come visit. And when they come and visit, just like JACO, they'll come and visit, and they're looking, they're not just gonna look at how your department's gonna, how it's acting, but they're going to look at how does it work multi-systemically? How does all the department work? How does the nurses interact with the physicians? How does the residents interact with faculty and patient care? So it's an experiential type of learning, and they want to see active engagement, and it, their intent is to, to monitor how you can improve performance in your institution. And they have six focus areas, and they want to provide formative feedback in these areas. And what are they? Well, here's their six focus areas. So patient safety they want to look at, health care quality, supervision, transitions in care, fatigue man management, and also professionalism. 
So I'll discuss all six of them and give you examples of how we're looking in to do it so that hopefully when they come to your institution, or at least you'll have a clue of what the continued learning environment is. So patient safety. Residents should be taught about the role of system thinking in forging a sustainable improvement in the, in the um, environment. So it, it's really important that uh, any action that they do, it has to help the whole institution. And the other thing that ACGME recognizes is that there's many opportunities for residents and trainees to learn, not only from faculty, but also from other experienced personnel. So uh, other, other MDs in other departments, uh, CRNAs they can learn from, uh, mid-level uh, uh, PAs, so there's all kinds how they can learn, and they have to take that into consideration. So what we're doing in our patient safety committee is we're focusing on how people be can become aware and work to address certain patient safety initiatives. We, they want to know, they should know situations where you can file a patient safety report, so you can turn it in and you can work on it. And a couple things, how many people here know the, uh, the Swiss cheese model? Good. There's a lot of residents don't even know what that is, and then I have this at the bottom, and what that is is that really, the, usually patient safety initiatives, there's multiple layers, and when there's a major problem, it's when those Swiss cheese holes all line up that the problem happens. So, and then how, who knows here what a fishbone uh, analysis is or a root cause analysis? So that's what that on the bottom right-hand side is there a fishbone or a root cause analysis, and a lot of residents don't even know what that is. And then, so if there's a problem, they do a fishbone analysis. So in what department, what happened, what was the cause? And as you can see right here, if you're late for work, there's a root cause analysis of the problems for being for work, as an example. So what we're doing is uh, you can do online modules for Institute for Healthcare Improvement. Does anyone know what that is? So we, it's like $500 or something for, and you can go online and they can teach you initiatives on patient safety. I'll show, this, show you this in my next uh, slide. And we also want to publish a lessons learned fact sheet. So if there's problems in patient safety, that we, there's multiple examples that we can learn from. So if it's published, then you can look at it and hopefully get some guidance for it. So this is the IHI, and it, they have a lot of, uh, programs that you can use for uh, improvement and you can just log on to it and you can see off the passport for IHI training in green right there and you can log on and do like modules and it helps with patient safety and what we do at our institution is they have to get so many credits or do so many of these so that they know how what about patient safety is and uh, this is a specific IHA module on the opioid epidemic. And it's like really rampant in our state, and I'm sure it's rampant wherever you are too. So it's a major problem. You can log on to it, and you can get uh, training uh, in opioid addiction as an example. So the next one is healthcare quality. And everyone needs to address quality improvement in your institution. And one of the things that ACGME recognizes is that you have to be competitive. Your system, so you have other healthcare systems, so it's like UCSF is, uh, is competing against uh, Stanford, and there's other hospitals. So you have to be competitive in the environment, and to be competitive, you have to address healthcare quality. And that's a whole idea where we talked about the age caps and all that all loops in. So trainees uh, are usually not as knowledgeable as us as far as healthcare improvement, so we need to work to make sure that they are. And there can be a constant improvement is critical, like I said, we need to remain competitive, and that's how it is uh, in this world. And residents should be able and encouraged to design and implement quality improvement projects. So by going on to say IHI and to, to be able to do that, in fact, there's a requirement that for residents to graduate from a residency program, they have to do patient safety and quality improvement projects. Uh, healthcare, what our committee is doing, so we're looking, our goal is to employ, we're using IHI, and we're looking at ways that not only just residents, but faculty within our healthcare system can successfully conduct a quality improvement project. And <clears throat> the next one is supervision, and supervision is the backbone for resident education. And it, you can go from different extremes. So how does one appropriately, you as a trainee, or, or I'm sorry, you as a, as a mentor, 
How are you going to train residents? How are you going to supervise CRNA students? How are you going to titrate supervision appropriately so that they can progress so that when they graduate that they know exactly and, and treat patients good without causing problems? And then the, how can you delegate authority? So those are really important uh, concepts. And it also, you need buy-in from administration, just for you to say to go ahead and do it. So administration has to have a leadership role in how to appropriately delegate authority to our, our trainees. So what are we doing? It's, uh, there has to be a constructive and a helpful way. And you, when you, you give supervision, it has to be non-derogatory. It has to be non-retaliatory. You have to treat residents appropriately, and it cannot be in a, a negative kind of way. And these type of treatments should not and will not be to tolerated. If you look on the other extreme, so it's derogatory and you treat, pay, it treat residents inappropriately, but the other problem that the ACGME recognizes is that you can have over-supervision. So constantly over-supervising, over micromanaging a, a trainee is bad because it can have negative consequences. We don't want to graduate somebody who is unprepared for independent practice, so it's very important. Our committee, so what we did is uh, we have an easily accessed tool. So when uh, the, we had a clear site visit, sort of like a JACO uh, visit, it's a clear site from ACGME, and one of the things that they came up with our institution, and they said, how do we know that your resident, if they're on the floor, how do we know they can insert a central line? I was like, oh, so we have to come up with a way. How, how does the, the nursing know that you can come in and do like a bone biopsy or whatever they need to do? How do you know that they, they can be able to do that? So we came up with a way and for procedures, and I'll show you on the next slide. And we also came up with on our GME website is we have a mistreatment and supervision button, of which I'll show you later. So those are ways and things that you can possibly use and implement uh, at your institution. So as far as procedures, how do you know that his, so this is our website, so in graduate medical education and under policies and procedures and you can click on, so this is a, a resident in a, that's in our, uh, it, that's doing an anesthesia residency. So he's, you can see it tells him what PGY status he is, so he's a PGY3. And if you go through the, the um, UHA policies and you can click on a certain site, and you can look on it, so you know that he's a PGY3, and if you can, you can look on here and see what types of procedures that they don't need to be, have required supervision. So as a PGY1, CB, CBY, you can see that, that for insertion of arterial line placement, that this person needs adequate supervision. So they, the nurses, when they see it, if they're gonna put in a, 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 an art line, then wow, we really need to get the attending and call the attending so that he can be there. And you can see as a PGY2 that that person is appropriate and is advanced long enough that he should be able to place an A-line with direct attending supervision. So the mistreatment supervision button, so we have this on, it on, on our ACG on our website. And this is an anonymous way for the promotion of a non-derogatory and a non-retaliatory culture. So if you feel like if you could be a nurse on the floor or you could be a resident and if you feel like you've been mistreated or a patient has been mistreated, all you have to do is go to this website, you anonymously click, click it in and you can go ahead and fill it out. You don't have to put your name on it, but if you wanted to, you're able to do that. So we have nurses from the floor that do that. We have residents that do it. We also have faculty that does it. And then on the other thing is professionalism. So if you have someone that's not treating a patient appropriately, or say like they're putting in a central line and they don't use local anesthesia, or they're taking about nine swipes or so to get a set, that's really inappropriate. So nurses can go on there for uh, professionalism. So issues like unethical behavior or treating someone inappropriately, you can go ahead and hit that professionalism. And we also have an exemplary professionalism too. So you can click on it. So say like a resident is doing something really well and you know there was like a, a, a bus crash or something like that and this resident was doing everything. I've seen some exemplary behavior where 
uh, like residents would come in and like, oh, this, the patient wanted like something to drink, so the resident went ahead and got a, you know, a, some soda and brought it into the patient or, or talked to the family and things like that. And how in our institution, it goes about 75, 25%. 25% of the time that we get exemplarism. So what happened is that that gets it forwarded to administration, so when we have our med medical executive committee meetings and administration sees that, they see exemplary behavior and they can also see unprofessional behavior too. So that's anonymous way and, and it's something that you, you can consider at your institution. So the next of the six uh, uh, of, uh, tr focus areas is transition and care. And residents must follow ACGME duty hour standards. So the problem that ACMG recognizes is that because of duty hours that there's gonna be more transitions of care. So you have to be able to transition from uh, a patient over to, to uh, from one resident to another resident. So there's gonna be an increase in transition and not only amongst tra trainees, but also in between departments. So you take a patient from the OR to the ICU, that's a transition of care. Somewhat, it, that's a, from exi existing departments from maybe the emergency room up to the OR, so in your, so that's really important. So we need to call attention importance of good handoffs and better care transitions. And how we say like come off bypass, it, that's really important, so you need to be in the room as you come off bypass. That should be just as important as transitions of care, and that's what ACMG looks to. Uh, one thing that we're doing is our care committee for transition to cares, we're looking for tools. So we're in the process of developing a possible transition of care uh, uh, form, a template that's on an existing me medical record. It, but what the thing is about it, they don't want it to be standardized. It should be tailored to each individual specialty. So it can't be like cookie cutter, but it, at least you can at least have a form. That, that's on the electronic medical record. And what's nice about it is not just like a sheet of paper that's just hanging there, but it, it can possibly be part of the EMR and you can go into it and actually see that it was done. The other thing about transition to care is that they want faculty involvement. They just not resident to resident or nurse to nurse. Faculty need to be involved and you need to evaluate how that's going. The next focused area is fatigue management and it's more than just duty hours. And I talked about that yesterday with the physician wellness, is that it's not just the duty hours, there's more, more problems involved, there's more errors involved, and there's more input that we need to look into. But it's really important, and it's time to, for residents to, and other faculty to care for themselves as, way, as just as they care for, for other, their patients. I talked to you yesterday about the increase in physician suicides, and there is, it brings a new meaning and a new urgency, and we really need to address it, and it's very important. So we have to teach residents, fellows, faculty, medical students, nursing students, nurses, to take care of themselves physically, mentally, and spiritually. So that's very important. So our, our uh, fatigue uh, management committee and wellness committee, it's combined, and I gave you a, a lecture on that yesterday. So we're trying to look at a systemic, a systematic approach so where all health professionals can be encouraged about the wellness. Some certain things, like I said, is to get a, a social worker that's involved, did a PHQ-9 survey that I talked about yesterday, uh, to have mentorship, uh, social activities, other support systems available, so that that's all what uh, would be included, and that's going to be a really big uh, thing to work on. But it's something that we can do and uh, approach it. So professionalism. So that's it. It, it compromises everything. It, you want to teach integrity. You want to teach accountability. You want to teach reliability. So all these. It, it's almost like you want the person to act. If you're not around, that person should be acting appropriately and being able to take care of patients. Uh, in a good way. So it does employ all the components of the six core competencies. So role modeling is important, mentoring is important, the, the safety culture in the institution, teamwork, patient interaction, sensitivity, diversity, and also looking at simulation as a way to, to try and teach professionalism. So those are all the six, and uh, in conclusion, there needs to be a closer link in education and healthcare delivery. It, professional learning needs to be experiential learning and it needs to be active engagement. It's not just the one department. It needs to be multi-departmental. It need, needs to be multi-systemic 
and it, in, in a training approach within the healthcare institution. So the continuing learning environment looks to address these issues. That's it.